thought, you know, we kind of believe this on, in, our, in our Greek thinking, but we don't probably understand it the way they do. But we believe when we tell the story of the cross and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, that the same power that was released at the cross is released again today. Because he actually says in Romans, the gospel, the telling of that story is the power of God to salvation. This is why you don't get people really transformed through little compromising sermons that you won't go to heaven when you die, raise your hand, pray this prayer after me, now you're okay. If you don't put the cross in there, if you don't get a revelation to them of sin and the need and his provision, then the power that's in the message can't be released. I don't get off on a tangent, but I actually studied the word to make sure he was telling me the truth because I was so fascinated by it. And in my studies, one of the lexicon said that the testimony, this word in Hebrew that means do again, says so it's like the Hebrew word remember, which doesn't just mean remember. It means remember and do. When God thinks about something, power begins to be released. He's so powerful, he can't think about it without something beginning to happen. So they gave me examples like, he remembered Hannah. You know, I always fast. I wonder why the Lord uses that kind of language. He didn't really forget Hannah. Right? So why did he say he remembered her? Well, he's not just saying he remembered her. He, he remembered the promise and power started flowing through him and she conceived. Because when he remembers, this is what, when he remembers, he does something. And this is why he said, put me in remembrance. It's not because he forgot. It's because when we start talking about it, he starts thinking about it. Power starts flowing. Now, I'm not trying to get off, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, I don't, I don't want to over, overwhelm you with information because what I'm really talking to you about right now is the power of history. He started telling me, he started saying things to me like, once in a while you need to get up and tell the story about this nation's beginning. Not just to, not just to motivate people that, hey, we ought to get back to there, but when you quote those people... And when you say what they said, we will be a city on a hill. It's doing more than just making a political statement. It's releasing something into the atmosphere. It's the power of history, and I need agreement. And I need you to say the same thing. That's what confession means. I need you to say the same thing. Because I can't do what I want to do what I started back then until there's agreement now. So I'm, I'm, I'm way behind. I'm getting, just going to get real hurry here, okay. I'm going to read two or three prophecies that been given to me or dreams as the case may be come on over the last year or so that are connected to this issue of history Clay gave me one or two of these dreams seemed like Clay's become a dreamer for me <clears throat> but he says this was about a year ago he said uh, I dreamed last night that you and a small group of us were invited to see POTUS Trump in the White House in the Oval Office upon arrival after some small talk President Trump very much in humility see God's doing a work in his life he's not there yet but he's moving him toward a visitation And I don't care how stubborn a person is or how prideful they are. 
when the Damascus Road experience hits, he knows how to knock them off their high horse. And they can get up from that experience different. So God put him there and God's using him and he needed to be a wrecking ball. Can you imagine having to deal with that mess in Washington, D.C.? Talk about a swamp. I got other words for it. But God's going to visit this man. I'll get to that in a second. But on arrival, he said, Trump, very much in humility, began to thank you for your leadership and for the appeal to heaven movement. Now, I'm not the only one that's trumpeted this message, but I'm one of them. He then presented to you an appeal to heaven flag he had signed. That wasn't an autograph to me when I prayed about this dream. It wasn't like he was autographing the flag. It was a dream interpretation. I felt like God was saying, this is, this is a, an endorsement from the highest authority in the land, a, an endorsement of prayer, and an endorsement of movement from the highest, most authoritative office in the land and the most powerful office in the world. So he signed it, gave it to me, and requested of you to organize a high-level strategic prayer task force. He told you that he would be releasing directly to you significant issues for prayer. He added that he had received this prophetic instruction from a very trusted voice, his wife, Melania. At that time, you presented to him a white stone and read to him Revelation 2.17. So I presented him this white stone and read Revelation 2.17. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows, but he who receives it. As I gave him this white stone and read that verse, he quoted to me, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Why is that significant? There's a six-year-old boy, son of a worship leader, came to his mama during the 2016 elections and said, Dad, uh, Mom, God, Jesus just told me who's going to be the next president. And she said, oh, really? Okay, who is it? And he said, John. Well, she didn't, there was no John. Just Donald and Hillary. So she just pats him on the shoulder and okay. And two weeks before the election, she's in travail, weeping over the elections. And one of the things she's prayed about is that she didn't really like either one of them. She didn't like his past. She didn't like his, his arrogance and some of his ways, and, and she didn't like Hillary. Sorry, Arkansas, but that might be a dislocation that needs healed. <laughs> but her boy, little boy came to her and said, Mommy, why are you crying? She said, I'm just praying over the elections. And he said, well, I already told you who's going to be president, John. And, and then a few weeks later, she realizes that the J in Donald J. Trump is John. Wow. And what the Lord spoke to me through that was, this is, this is what I believe he said. And I'm going to speak in, his fir in first person from him. This is what I believe he said to me. I didn't call him Donald when I referred to him, to that little boy. I didn't call him the Donald, the tycoon, the billionaire. I called him John. And to me, that's the forerunner. That's the revelator. The man of revelation. That's intimacy. The one who laid his head on Jesus' breast that had this intimacy. Do you believe that God could do such a work in this guy that he could become a friend, an intimate friend with Jesus? See, I believe... 
I believe there's a visitation coming to Donald John Trump to transform him from the Donald to John. And I believe that's what this dream was all about. He came in humility, and when I gave him that stone, he knew what it was all about. And he said, there was a man sent from God whose name was not Donald, but John. And then, and if that doesn't encourage you, then you're in the wrong place. <laughs> he then asked if he could pray for all of us in the dream. And in his prayer, he said this, and listen to me when I listen to this prayer. Lord, let this man and these leaders convene a holy convocation that I might finish my eight years well. That's not the part I'm, I'm focusing on. Although I believe we need him for another term, but that I might finish my ears well in the ancient markers of our founding fathers be restored. Let them lead a holy convocation so that I can finish well and so that the ancient markers of our founding fathers be restored.